uh, good evening, everyone. Thank you for joining us today. Uh, special thanks to, to the founders from Southeast Asia who are staying up late for this. A very, very warm welcome to the first edition of the Brick by Brick series, where we talk to the brightest minds from across the world on best practices in building insurgent brands. We're super excited about our first ever talk series that we're sharing with the broader consumer ecosystem. The title should be intuitive for the DSG founders. Uh, however, I think for the larger audience, I should clarify uh, the reason why we chose Brick by Brick as the title for our talk series. Uh, this goes back to the origins of DSG. We were founded in 2012 and pioneered early stage consumer investing because we felt consumer brands required a different philosophy and business building approach when compared to tech businesses. In a nutshell, our belief is that enduring brands are built brick by brick with a strong focus on fundamentals and hence the name. Uh, this is a talk series that's tailor made for consumer founders. Uh, the topic for the first edition is lessons learned from over 15 years of growth stage investing in consumer brands. We have with us Wayne Wu, general partner at VMG Partners, joining in from SF. VMG Partners is a leading consumer brand focused private equity fund founded in 2005. They manage assets over 2 billion US dollars. The firm has invested in a number of iconic brands, including Justin's Nut Butter, Kind Nutrition, Quest Nutrition, Drunk Elephant, Lily Sweets, and many, many more. The firm also has an amazing track record of exits, and Wayne has been with the firm since the very beginning and has seen it all. Wayne, thrilled to have you with us in the first edition, and thank you so much for doing this early morning. Thanks for having me. That was very kind. I'll, I hope I live up to everything you just said. No, no, you absolutely would. <laughs> and audience, throughout the conversation, if you have any questions, please post them in the Q&A window. I've allocated 15 minutes for Q&A towards the end of the conversation. Uh, so welcome again, Wayne. And for the benefit of the founders, would be good if you could give a quick introduction on VMG and how the firm came to be. Sure, sure. I, I technically have not been there since the beginning. I was really close. I was the second. Okay. I was the second team member to join after the founding. So I joined January two thousand eight. Our final close of of our first fund at VMG was in summer of two thousand seven. Um, right. You know, and so our our we haven't really changed much since the beginning. You know, our our focus has been to to help build iconic brands and great business models. Um, so our first fund was a $325 million fund back in uh, you know, that 2007, 2008 range. Um, we invest in branded, uh, branded food and beverage, personal care, beauty, pet, uh, the wellness supplement space and fitness. Um, where we've evolved over time is now we have, we're investing on two different funds. We have our BMG Catalyst Fund, which mm -hmm. where we just raised our second fund, which is a $400 million vehicle to invest in the tech stack that powers consumer brands. So think about the tech infrastructure mm -hmm. related mm -hmm. to consumer retail. And then our, our core growth fund is an $850 million vehicle where we're investing out of our fifth fund now still focused in the same areas in, you know, in the branded CPG categories I've mentioned, as well as some multi-unit within those, within those respective categories. And mm -hmm. we're evaluating in early days, uh, potential supply and contract manufacturing in those core categories. So if you think about how we're thinking about the future, you have brands, brands as the core, and then both the tech infrastructure, but also the physical infrastructure that powers these brands. Got it, got it. 
So, you know, I think a good place to start this conversation uh, would be on, on the investment decision-making framework at BMG. We have a lot of founders on this call who raised their seed and Series A funding. Uh, so if you could walk us through, you know, at a very high level on the investment evaluation framework, the, the key aspects that you evaluate and, and perhaps some high priority metrics you look at as well. We try not to overcomplicate it. Um, you know, at, 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 the, at the root of it, we're trying to evaluate if there's, if there's real consumer demand for the product. And there's a lot of noise that comes to that process. A lot of times, you know, I think both investors and entrepreneurs are just seeking growth for growth's sake, meaning it's all just about revenue growth at any cost and all revenue being created equal. And we really don't look at it that way. We, mm -hmm. we whether it's, whether the business is, you know, direct to consumer oriented or some blend of omni-channel through brick and mortar retail, we want to look, we're really focused on, on repeat purchase and relative performance to its respective category. So it's all about velocities and repeat, you know, so right. certainly when we look at a business and someone shares their financials that are generally, you know, um, their own shipment data, that's all mm -hmm. fine and good that it's growing, but we really want to unpack the direct to consumer and omni-channel metrics to really mm -hmm. understand the economics of each transaction, mm -hmm. as well as the velocities and repeat, repeat of purchase. So that's kind of one bucket. So if right. we don't have that first bucket, then we're generally not interested. That's the, that's the first important part of it, um, mm -hmm. is understanding the economics, velocities, and repeat. If those are exciting to us, then we want to mm -hmm. further dig into the economics and supply chain. So understanding gross margin, contribution margin, and what the supply chain looks like in terms of either their own vertical integration of manufacturing or... Mm -hmm. um, or what the contract manufacturing landscape looks like for that particular product. And if that, if that is scalable um, and you know, scalable from that dynamic, then it's interesting. I'll add also on the first point, we want to look at the TAM. So are they, you know, what what are the relative velocities, um, economics, and repeat mm -hmm. look like? And what is the overall market landscape? Because with a lot of new age categories. Defining mm -hmm. TAM is an, is an art, not a science. And yep. what is the real TAM? Because a lot of times we'll get investment pitch books that define TAM in some massive way. And mm -hmm. that's really not necessarily how that, it's not really the market that that company may be playing in. Mm -hmm. And so it's really defining what does the TAM look like to be able to build a scale business under our investment period, but also right. leave enough remaining TAM for the next owner of the business where they're excited about it too. So again, you have TAM, mm -hmm. you have velocities, repeat economics, you have gross margin supply chain, mm -hmm. and then you have um, founder fit and alignment. So, you know, um, with founders and the team, do we have a, mm -hmm. do we have an aligned vision as to what we're building? Cause it's, it's hard enough to build an entrepreneurial brand and company um, but if, if you don't see eye to eye as to what the finish line looks like, then mm -hmm. it could be a real challenge. So this is definitely not in the order of importance. You know, at the right. end of the day, we're not going to partner with anybody unless we feel like there's a line vision of what we're building and as importantly, a line vision in terms of what the values are, you know, in terms of who we mm -hmm. all are as people, who we are as human beings, and how do we make positive impact in the world? Got it. Got it. No, that's that's really interesting. And, you know, especially your comment on just not absolute velocity metrics, et cetera, but, but you're always looking at velocity versus category benchmarks or, or even competition. Uh, you know, one, one aspect that you didn't mention, but perhaps, you know, you look at it, uh, it is covered and what you mentioned is, is on the brand itself. So, um, you know, how important is is the strength of the brand in your you know investment decision making process and how do you also assess the the defensibility 
of a brand of a business that that you're evaluating that's a great question you know a lot of times you know it's a combination of different metrics mm -hmm. you know i personally find there's nothing stronger than still consumers voting with their wallets so i still go right. back to the economics relative velocities to category mm -hmm. and repeat purchase there will we'll often add on other more there's still quantitative metrics but not mm -hmm. but not financial so mm -hmm. you know net promoter score satisfaction mm -hmm. you know propensity to recommend social media metrics in terms of followers engagement things of that nature mm -hmm. you know so those are nice to have metrics that help support the core the core of you know the right economics velocity relative velocities and mm -hmm. um and repeat right because at the end of the day you know it's, and it's also time you know do they mm -hmm. show strength in those metrics over over a period of time there's a lot of brands that do really well for a short mm -hmm. period of time call it you know 12 24 months but if they're able to keep up the strength of those metrics i described it really shows the strength of a brand. Got it. Yeah, the the endurance matters matters a bit. You know, matters a lot as well. Completely agree. And you know, we spoke about the defensibility, uh, you know, of a brand and how you think about it. But you know, when again, just coming back to how you assess defensibilities from a business standpoint at the stage, you know, you are evaluating a company, etc. Uh, have you observed any patterns in your successful investments in terms of, you know, specific capabilities that that help them build long-term defensibilities? There's nothing stronger than building a great brand, and where they've proven that they they don't need to discount to to sell the product. So, right. you know, a good metric is just understanding how strong are the velocities. <clears throat> The velocities and repeat at reg price mm -hmm. so the consumers are not you know where they're not buying it based on value or price in, mm -hmm. in doing that over a period of time that's that's really important we haven't put much into patents or things of that nature because at the end of the day for a lot of the type of categories we play in people mm -hmm. can work around patents and they're very expensive to achieve so we're much more focused on brand and trademark ownership than we mm -hmm. are about patents. Um, sometimes there is a supply chain advantage that's defensible. Mm -hmm. So if the product is unique enough where that vertical integration or unique third-party contract manufacturing regime creates defensibility, that's usually just a head start. If there's mm -hmm. enough of a TAM and market size, that mm -hmm. supply chain advantage usually normalizes over a period of time as other people build supply chain capabilities. But it gives mm -hmm. you that head start to invest and build that brand. So right. all roads, all roads lead back to, you know, build it, building a strong brand, you know, in terms of defensibility right. in, in the type of categories and products that we invest mm -hmm. in. Got it. Got it. And, you know, switching to business fundamentals, you did touch upon a few metrics like, you know, the store velocity, et cetera. But what are the top and you also mentioned about gross margin what would be your you know go to top two three metrics that that you use to assess business health i mean gross margin is obviously one of them you know i right. think we've been universally we've universally struggled when we've had gross margins under 30 mm percent -hmm. so 30 percent fully loaded gross margins you know if it's above 30%, it doesn't mean it's great. But if it's below 30%, it's almost assuredly bad. And we found that to be, you know, something we've learned, we've learned over time. Mm -hmm. um, there's no magic to velocity, you know, units per store per week, dollars per store per week. That's, that's a really important metric, but it's mm -hmm. important in a relative sense, comparing a beverage to a snack item on velocity is not a meaningful data point. So it's important in diligence and also as an entrepreneur to obtain mm -hmm. the data to get a feel for 
what are your relative velocities compared to your peer set? And right. then that's the same on direct to consumer comparing, you know, LTV to CAC and your ROAS, um, mm -hmm. your profitability on first purchase. All of those metrics are, are hard to compare cross category. It's really around category to category, but more and more profitability on first purchase is really important. Justifying justifying spend on LTV is really a difficult proposition. We've never been a real believer in justification of, of CAC um, based on LTV. We really wanna understand what the, what the first purchase economics look like. Okay, irrespective of how frequent the, the purchases are, your preference is to, to ensure that the business makes money on the first transaction itself. Not that, you know, if it doesn't make money, we want to understand how far from it we didn't, right. you know, so it's again, it's art, not science. We yeah. don't, we're not ones to believe in a long-term LTV justification of the spend, mm -hmm. you know, so mm -hmm. we don't want to see two year payback or something like that, you know, like, um, and, and gross, you know, the gross margin and gross margin as it relates to LTV and CAC are obviously really important metrics too. You know, yeah. where we struggle is sometimes the highest repeat purchase categories sometimes have the lowest gross margins. Yeah. Therefore, the near-term payback is really poor. And then the only thing you can hang your hat on is LTV because mm -hmm. the gross margins are low. So it's hard to drive anywhere near profitability on first purchase. So you have to justify a frequent repeat purchase over a period of time. Mm -hmm. But then a lot of times the companies don't have enough operating history to really validate what LTV really looks like because they maybe have their mm -hmm. oldest cohort, maybe you know still a year old or two years mm -hmm. max. And that's really hard to you know, if there's a one to two year payback on LTV and the total operating history of the company is one to two years, you right. know, and the gross margins are low, but for right. but theoretical repeat purchase is high. It's hard to make all that. It's too much storytelling for us, you know? Sure. Um, got, it. got it. So for, for such businesses that don't have a long enough history, what are sort of the, you know, ideal targets that that you think founders should have in terms of payback period or ltv to cash it depends on a category no. you know that's, no. that's not an exact science right you know my, mm. my biggest point of feedback is i think it's really tough you know for obvious reasons you know i believe entrepreneurs should have more control of their own destiny if they're creating a business that relies on a lot of theoretical long-term payback metrics they're going to mm -hmm. be at the mercy of the capital raising market. And, you know, the sooner a notch for, ob you know, obvious math, the sooner that they can build, you know, real profitability, the sooner they, they have more control over their destiny where they don't have to just stay on the fundraising hamster wheel and, yeah. and be able to have control of if, and when they want to raise strategic capital versus have to raise capital because they built they built a business model that has a, a real finite life life span to it unless they raise more capital. Got it. No, completely aligned and resonate resonate with that very deeply. That that's a good segue into you know the next section of the conversation where I'd like to spend some time on your views on uh, you know how consumer brands can achieve profitability, et cetera. Uh, I think the first one is I've heard you, you know, talk about this in, in some of your interviews where you talk about the correlation that you've seen between profitability of businesses and the size of outcomes that, that you've seen at VMG. So could you, you know, shed some light on that and on, on what, what you mean by that? Absolutely. It's interesting. You know, I think I think too many investors and entrepreneurs start companies based on press releases. And, and what I mean by that is they, you know, and I think it, it makes sense because they don't have any 
other purview. So they see, you know, a company like Justin's acquired by Hormel, the only metrics they can find are some type of reported revenue number and an acquisition value. And then they, you know, people extrapolate a revenue multiple and assume that, well, that company must have been purchased on a revenue multiple. You know, I think capital raising in the early stages has some form of revenue multiple because oftentimes the companies are not profitable. So you have to value it on something. But when it comes to actual acquisition by a strategic acquirer, which has been our primary focus over the history of BMG is building brands for strategic acquisition, sometimes IPO, but our primary under, underwriting methodology is towards a strategic acquirer, one of the global CPG global global CPGs, you, mm -hmm. I generally find that the revenue multiple is really just a function of math. And the real driver is some type of projected discounted cash flow and EBITDA multiple. And so in order to maximize value, you know, it's really the triangulation of growth and profitability. So even if you look at the US public markets today in terms of the, the consumer growth IPOs, the best mm -hmm. performing IPOs are more like the 10 and 10. So they have at least 10% growth and at least 10% EBITDA margin. And it's not the ones with 50% growth losing, you know, losing money or break even. And I, I find it to be the same way in terms of maximizing value for strategic acquisition is, mm -hmm. you know, think about it like 15 and 15 at a mature state, growing more than 15% on the top line and mm -hmm. a 15% EBITDA margin. And, and usually that strong 15% EBITDA margin translates to strong gross margins. Strong gross mm -hmm. margins are different things for different categories, but usually it's somewhere over 40%. And in some categories, over 50%, you know, gross right. margins. And when, right. you, when you're able to achieve that 15 and 15, you mm -hmm. know, and sometimes hopefully that's like 30% growth plus and 15% EBITDA margins, you know, then you get that 20, you know, sometimes you can get 20 times plus as an EBITDA multiple on mm -hmm. that, you know, from a strategic acquirer, and it leads to a large revenue multiple, you know, based on the math. But then, mm -hmm. you know, that a lot of times that's still reported on the press release as a revenue, you know, here's the acquisition yeah. multiple, and then it's some dated sales number you know, of the last full year reported period and people extrapolate a revenue multiple from that. So the upshot mm -hmm. again is, you know, um, nail both top and bottom line, you know, mm -hmm. in, an, in an effort to maximize value and you control your own destiny again to, to not get stuck on the capital raising hamster wheel. And we find that entrepreneurs and management teams that are capital efficient along the way are generally the best management teams. They know their business better than, than businesses that were just focused on growing top line for top line sake and are stuck on the capital raising hamster wheel. They generally don't know their businesses as well. Right. No, that's that's really well said. And and it's, you know, it's quite enlightening that uh, you know, that that you're saying that most of the CPG strategics also look at, you know, or rather the primary uh, uh, multiple that they apply when valuing businesses is EBITDA multiple as opposed to just revenue multiple. Uh, it, it was something that I wanted to ask you as well, given your you know track record of multiple exits. So you mentioned clearly revenue growth is a major driver uh, and, and the EBITDA margins are a major driver in terms of just value creation. Are there any other aspects that strategics really, you know, pay top dollars or pay a premium for uh, with respect to a brand or a business? Well, scale is important. So the scale mm -hmm. point for strategic acquisition has moved up. You know, um, I find that, you know, the, 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 the market kind of ebbs and flows, but, yeah. you know, you see very little strategic interest for brands with less than 75 million of US dollar revenue. Like mm -hmm. there needs to be a real scale point. Mm -hmm. The other dynamic is it's not that you should sacrifice growth for profit. Growth is almost like table stakes. Right. So you need growth in order for interest from strategics. Right. But growth's not good enough. You need that growth combined with 
strong profitability. But you can't just have strong profitability and no growth. Like that doesn't work either. Yeah. Like right. growth is a checkbox in order to have any interest. Mm -hmm. Then to get it across the finish line, you need to have strong profitability metrics too. Mm -hmm. And then that growth needs to be unpacked with that growth needs to go back to the same metrics we talked about before, which are related mm -hmm. to strong velocities relative to category, mm -hmm. um, strong repeat, strong brand metrics. You got to mm -hmm. have it all to be acquired by a strategic. And that's, you know, I think that's where, you know, I see so many investment decks of like, hey, we're going to get acquired by a strategic. You know, mm -hmm. there's really there's really only so many brands that have been acquired by strategics, you know, relative right. to how many brands are started, how many brands investors invest in. You have mm -hmm. to essentially create a perfect business. You have to yeah. nail growth, profitability, regulatory compliance, legal, supply chain, trademarks, team, large TAM, like got to nail it all. And that's, you know, that's mm -hmm. where we're focused with our, our brands that we invest in is, hey, mm -hmm. revenue growth is great, but we got to nail it all. And, and we work together on working backwards from the experience we've had over the years, starting mm -hmm. day one, actually starting before we even close on our investment. Because again, alignment's really important. We align yeah. on what, what are we building? Mm -hmm. And then we hit the ground running on built on really working through the front and back end metrics of trying to build a business that gives us the highest probability of strategic interest and building the best team we can in the industry to be able to hit those strategic goals in that and in, in the in the vis, the various front end and back end dynamics that can give us the highest mm -hmm. probability to have that strategic buyer interest downstream. Got it. Got it. No, that's that's very very useful, and you know we at DSG are big believers in in controlling your destiny and you know not not being dependent on on fundraisers to to keep surviving. So you know on that, wanted to ask you something. We always tell our founders that the simplest way to make money is by not losing money. It's sort of the inversion principle that Charlie Munger talks about a lot. So. You know, just by avoiding ways to lose money, you know, you can ensure that you you are able to make money. So would would like to understand in your experience, what are the common reasons why consumer brands struggle to achieve profitability? Great question. Poor gross margins. You know, the, the, number, the, the, number, the number one dynamic well, we're just starting out. We're going to have great gross margins when we have scale. I found that nine out of 10 times, I'm, you know, again, this is not an exact science. This is my own personal estimation. Nine out of 10 times, that company will not achieve the gross margins they think they will through scale. You know, the brands that have strong gross margins from the beginning stay mm -hmm. having strong gross margins. And the ones that start business models with poor gross margins are stuck with them. Now, there are one to two out of 10 cases where that scale benefit truly occurs, but mm -hmm. I find most of the time it does not. And it leads to chronic um, cash burn issues. So that's mm -hmm. one. Okay. Two, it's the concept that, that um, of almost over-marketing. So not mm -hmm. really creating, not really giving the brand a chance to see if there's organic demand for it. So it's spending, spending irrational amounts on marketing versus really tactic, really tactical and, and strategic marketing that drives consumption. So trying to be all things to all people. So for example, not focused on looking at ROAS and CAC to LTV and profitability on first purchase, really refining how that direct-to-consumer marketing would work or focus on out-of-home buying billboards and all sorts of things, you know, mm -hmm. to try to drive launch. A lot of times the best brands don't have to do all that. And it creates a culture of spend when you launch that way. It's hard to get out of that routine of, of overspend on marketing. Mm -hmm. And then the other piece is built the, the, the mis the misconception that a great team means a lot of people. 
A great team means hiring really talented player coaches. You need a small handful of people who really want to roll up their sleeves, who are strategic and tactical um, to build a great business. There's, you know, companies that overbuild total headcount too early, mm -hmm. you know, leads to chronic cash burn because building a lot of team means they want, you know, they generally end up spending on other things. So it's not mm -hmm. just the cost of the people, but it's the cost of the various initiatives where that focus, a focused player coach team with a focused um, marketing strategy combined with the right gross margins generally mm -hmm. lead to capital efficiency. And it's either going to work or it's not. If a company mm -hmm. had to hire a ton of people, spend a ton on marketing, have to scale into strong gross margins later, it probably was never meant to be in the first place. Got it. Got it. So it's gross margins, marketing strategy, and uh, you know, and ensuring that you don't you don't go crazy hiring a really large team. If I were to say right. right. you need a yeah. great team, but sometimes mm -hmm. people equate great team with quantity of team. And that's sure. that that's that's a very different thing. Right, right. Got it. Uh, you know, a related question is, you know, on, on this whole growth versus profitability paradox. And, uh, you know, our founders always tell us that investors like, you know, like BMG or, or DSG for that matter, seem to be rare in the ecosystem who speak about profitability, et cetera. And they just feel pressurized to, uh, you know, to, to show a certain growth to ensure that, uh, you know, they are, they're seen as building exciting businesses. Uh, so it's a conversation that, you know, that, that we have with most of our founders. Uh, what would your guidance be uh, in terms of how founders should, should think about the right pace at which they grow and, uh, you know, and also the scale at which they, they ought to become profitable? I understand it, it's in the U.S. context, but, you know, just the principles that, that you think they should use to, you know, just pace the growth appropriately and get to profitability. That'll be useful for, for everyone to understand. And that's a good caveat. Know that all of my commentary is related to yeah. kind of a U.S. and Canadian uh, perspective. Right. This is, yeah. I, I, am, I am not, you know, I am far from an expert on, yeah. on, uh, on the Asian, you know, the Asian markets as it relates right. to that point. Right. Um, from a profit, it really depends on the category, mm -hmm. you know, I, I, mm -hmm. there's not a, there's, there's, there's not an absolute to it. Yeah. I've found historically that, you know, there's been real correlation, you know, when we've been able to invest in brands that have strong growth and they're already profitable by 15 million of us dollar revenue. So there's mm -hmm. strong growth and they're profitable at that point. That's usually a very good signal you know, in terms of the business model that they've created, because usually that implies the gross margins are pretty strong. Right. Um, it also, it also implies that um, the team, you know, uh, that they're driving strong growth at that level, that it's, um, you know, that it's, you know, that there's, um, you know, it's a real path. There. Can you hold on a second real quick? Uh, while Wayne joins us, uh, you know, please. Uh, Sorry about that. No problem. I was just telling the audience that they can uh, post their questions in the Q and A tab. Yeah, please, please continue. Yeah. yeah. So you know that 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 probably be my rough rule of thumb is you know is around fifth you know fifteen million ish of revenue. Um, mm -hmm. Like we've had we've seen strong correlation when when you're seeing profitability or strong profitability from there at that point that um you know that's correlated with and, and then you're seeing strong growth at that there's right. there's something that you know strong growth and strong velocity metrics there's that's right. usually some good signaling got it got it and you know for the benefit of the audience in in our experience this is again in the indian context in terms of uh pacing yourself our view is you know if you can drive to 
100 crores, which is roughly 15 million. Interestingly, the number you mentioned. In five to six years from, from incorporating the company, our belief is that's a great pace uh, you know, from our portfolio and outside. So getting to that $15 million mark in five to six years is, is a good pace to grow at. And in terms of profitability, our view is similar. Ideally, you, know, you, uh, you should be profitable in the $15 million mark, which is 100 crores in INR terms. Uh, but, you know, if not by 200 crores. So, uh, you know, those are sort of, uh, you know, internal benchmarks that, uh, that we use at DSG. But, but that's, that's very helpful. Uh, way. It's a rule of thumb, you know, like, yeah, absolutely. it's not to say we don't invest in brand, you know, it's, yeah, it, it's it, everything I'm talking about, it's art, not science. And that's, you yeah. know, I, I think for us, it's the learnings of over the last 15 years helps right. us kind of calibrate. We, I don't believe in absolutes of like, well, it's got to meet this metric or that metric, or we're not going to invest in it. It's all, it's all subjective and objective. And it's a combination of all those dynamics that, that lead to us making a, a decision on whether we partner or not. No, absolutely. Uh, couldn't agree more. Uh, you know, I think a related dimension, uh, you know, when it comes to this growth, versus profitability discussion is, is around capital efficiency. You did, uh, you know, reference that multiple times in the conversation. Uh, and I know it's your pet peeve as well, the tendency on the part of investors and founders to overcapitalize brands in pursuit of unrealistic growth sometimes. What would your advice be on how founders should think about the quantum of capital that they raise in a growth stage round? Oh gosh. I mean, it depends on the company, you know, I'll start with the why it, right. it, I am, um, I love, you know, I, I admire entrepreneurship and what, what I struggle the most is seeing when a very successful business gets to the finish line and the founders own very little of it. And, you know, and so much of that is defined on how much they're going to own of their business, mm -hmm. you know, in those first few years of, of starting yep. that brand or company. Mm -hmm. And so that's why I really like to stress all these various metrics, because sometimes the decisions that are made in those first handful of years in terms of the business model created and the mm -hmm. capital raised even at high values is massively dilutive to that founder or founding team. So as a result, you know, I, 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 I like to focus on thinking about how to, how to create capital efficiency where it gets profitable sooner rather than later so that, mm -hmm. so that they don't need to raise as much capital, how much it is. It really depends on, on the yeah, gross margins, of the, of it, it's circular. It's circular, right? Depends on the gross margins of the business. It mm -hmm. depends on the approach and what the contribution margins look like. You know, right. the the you know on some of the D 2 C driven businesses mm -hmm. where you know where gross margin is seemingly high, but they're spending you know 20, 30 percent in marketing to get to that contribution margin, even though gross margin is seemingly high, they still need to fund that growth engine. You know, right. Um, right. sometimes you have primarily brick and mortar businesses in the U.S. that are have a small D to C, but they've really built themselves through Amazon and brick and mortar. They may be and they, and if they if they pair that with strong gross margins, mm -hmm. they may raise little or no money to get to 15 right. plus million of revenue and mm -hmm. and they own all of their businesses. And I love that. I, you know, there's nothing that brings me more joy than seeing a a business, you know, 15, 20, 30 million of US revenue, and they haven't raised a dime. You know, I really admire and and to say that that's not possible, I see it, I see it all the time, actually. You know, it is quite possible. It's just a path of how they've chosen to structure their business and the dynamics within that re that respective category. Some categories it's not possible based on the gross margins of that category, but there right. are many that that you can and and you know, it's certainly possible. It's not common, but it's mm -hmm. possible. 
Got it. But that's a Got real it. signal to us. You know, when we see a business that's grown, you know, to 15, 30 million dollars and it's profitable and they're out there raising capital. And I mm -hmm. love it when they have the benefit of choice. They go, oh, you know, we may or may not take capital, you know, but we really want a great partner. That, that's to us like the dream scenario, because a lot of times those type of entrepreneurs will, will, you know, they want BMG. They want BMG not because they need capital. They want BMG because they want a great partner. We want someone who wants a great partner. A lot of people, a lot of entrepreneurs will say that every time, but at the end of the day, they, they need uh, for some, because of their business model, they just need capital and they may have been diluted significantly. So they're looking at valuation as a primary metric because I can respect that because they're just trying to manage their dilution because they've raised a lot of capital. What I yeah. love is when they, when, when entrepreneurs say, I don't even need capital. I just want to find the best partner. And those are those are great scenarios where where we where we get really fired up to get get involved um, to help support that that uh, that journey. Got it. Got it. Uh, that's super useful. And you know, just talking about quantum of capital, uh, you know, that uh, founders should raise. Of late, a lot of our portfolio comprises uh, digital first brands, and you know, the biggest use of funding is always in marketing, which is you know towards Facebook and, and Google. And, uh, you know, we've, we've, as we speak, there are a lot of uh, brands in the portfolio that are figuring out how to keep the customer acquisition cost in check as they scale. And the recent iOS update didn't help. So, you know, would, would like to understand the best practices that you've seen in brands that have kept the customer acquisition cost in check as they scale and, and probably optimize over time. So it would, would be great to understand uh, from you on that. You know, I wish there was a perfect answer to that. You know, right. um, you know, the, the, we're still, we're, I think we're still coming off an era where there were a lot of brands built on Facebook. Mm -hmm. And, and that's, that's, that's been largely a macro challenge for most D 2 C brands now of trying to find other other customer acquisition channels that are, are that are as efficient. Mm -hmm. So the upshot is, you know, the brands that have continued to have really efficient customer acquisition are those that aren't just Facebook ad driven. So they may have other content that they create, you know, mm -hmm. where there's a compelling reason for a consumer to interact with their brand. They, mm -hmm. they have a unique influencer strategy where they it's a it's some influencer affiliate program where you know there's there's other means of driving brand awareness and trial through through various influencers um mm -hmm. people have interesting compelling tiktok campaigns hard to measure but you know but they but you're seeing some brands do really well with some compelling tiktok campaign um mm -hmm. other video content so it's really around you know, the, the, the sort of low hanging fruit of targeted Facebook ads has largely, you know, largely come to an end and mm -hmm. direct to consumer brands have to be a lot more creative about, about developing compelling content strategies mm -hmm. to drive efficient customer acquisition. And you're finding that more direct to consumer brands have to go omni-channel earlier or at all, you know, a lot of direct consumer brands that never considered going into brick and mortar are having to do so now. Mm -hmm. um, and, you know, to, to really diversify their, their acquisition channels, but also continue to grow their businesses efficiently. But we're, we're continuing to see really creative folks. It's just, it's, it's been, it's really interesting to, to see innovation in this area because we had a whole era where it was really a targeted Facebook ad driven marketplace. And now you're seeing a lot more diversification in, in how people go at it. Some people have cracked the code on it. And I think it, it's a real testament to the strength of their brand and creativity. And there's mm -hmm. some that haven't cracked the code and they're, they're having to figure it out. Right, right. Got it. No, and you know, moreover, as you said, uh, one of the reasons you mentioned brands find it challenging to become profitable is, uh, you know, not 
uh, sort of overspending in in marketing, and uh, you know, and as you said, if if people have uh, cracked the unit economics and have paid attention to keeping the acquisition costs in check from day one, that that itself should should set them well for for the future. The other part I wanted to ask you on was about entering the offline channel, but but I heard you say that brands are uh, diversifying into the offline channel early on to to keep the acquisition costs in check. And not necessarily early on, it's just at a point in time because mm -hmm. there's real benefit to leveraging that online digital marketing spend. It helps right. drive velocities in, in brick and mortar too. So it's a... Right. It's sometimes a shame that, that that investment spend on online and digital isn't leveraged in driving brick and mortar. So I think it's in, you, in the US, you have brick and mortar retailers who are interested in building digital first, uh, bringing in digital first brands into their stores. So it's a nice, it's a nice complementary marketplace in the US where you have interest from the retailers and bring in digital first brands and you have digital first brands that are more interested in omni-channel, but it, you know, it's really, it just kind of depends on, on the category and stage and, and all of that on what's right for one company is not necessarily right for the other. Got it. Got it. Uh, I see a, you know, few questions come up, but, you know, let me try and wrap up, uh, you know, my questions before that. The last section I'd like to focus on Founders, you know, uh, as you said, you said you didn't mention the investment criteria in any order, but I think that founders are your biggest criteria. Uh, what, what are the important traits that that you will look for in founders while investing? And uh, could you also talk through common traits that that you've seen in your most successful founders? First one is self awareness. Mm -hmm. So. You know, great entrepreneurs, in my opinion, you know, there's two things. It's almost like it, it sometimes self-awareness kind of goes both ways. In some regards, you have to have an, an, um, an extraordinary self-belief because it's hard to be an entrepreneur and you and entrepreneurs are are have this vision to be able to see opportunity where oftentimes others don't. And to, to have that vision, you have to have innate self-belief. Mm -hmm. But also, great founders have the ability to evolve and see that, that innate self-belief in creating that opportunity, have, to have enough self-awareness to build strength around them of, where, of understanding their own strengths and areas of opportunities and building a great team around them to be able to help be experts in the areas where it's not that founder's strengths. Mm -hmm. And then you combine that with being a good human being and a tremendous work ethic. And mm -hmm. if you have all of that dynamic of, you know, that, that leads to generally a lot of great outcomes, you know, because, you know, that ability to evolve and bring great people around him or her you know, um, when you combine that with great work ethic and and a strong value system of being a good human being, you know, a lot of great things can happen. Got it. And, uh, you know, in terms of common traps that, that you see founders fall into, common mistakes that, that founders make, areas where you find yourself repeatedly cautioning founders on, could you Talk a bit on that as well. In, in, from, in terms of business model or? No, in terms of, it could be, yeah, it could be in terms of business models, important strategic decisions. Uh, you know, again, more just learning from past mistakes made and, um, you know, and trying to understand if there are like common mistakes. I think, I think the um, unrealistic optimism and not, and not having sufficient paranoia so I think it's that it's that it's the optimism that creates visionary opportunities, which makes entrepreneurs great. Mm -hmm. I think having a sufficient level of paranoia. So a couple things: one, 
always assuming that the next day is going to be better than the last one. So, mm -hmm. you know, do you, at some point de-risking the, the journey for themselves after you build at a certain point, consider take some chips off the table so that they don't keep all of their equity only in the business and, mm -hmm. and don't take care of their families. I think, that, I think there's, that, that's an important point of don't always assume the yeah. next day is always going to be better than the last one. Mm -hmm. all, um, redundancy. So if I, if I had a nickel for every time a single source supply business goes, oh, I have a great contract manufacturer, but mm -hmm. that's their only source of supply. So really supply is the supply is the bedrock of branded product businesses. So mm -hmm. having redundancy and supply for the rainy day mm -hmm. and, and, and know that that unlikely things happen and to make sure that you, you always have product to sell to consumers. So we're like seen so many times founders um, burned by single source, uh, single source supply. Yeah. Um, and then uh, third again is just around self-awareness, you know, not, uh, not evolving the, the business team and how it's run based on different scaling points running a hundred million dollar business the same way it was run with the same team, same methodologies as when it was 10, as an example, like businesses mm -hmm. require evolution. I think lastly is not, uh, not understanding everything as an ecosystem. So not treating people properly, you know, we're, in, you know, about, uh, sometimes I'll hear we're, we're different. We're a new age brand. We don't need to ad adhere to any of the retailer rules or or how how business is done with retailers. We're reinventing everything, and we don't need to treat suppliers and retailers with the same level of respect that you know other companies in the past have. We can do it our way, and they just need us. You know, I think that sometimes that hubris and arrogance you know, works, you know, for a while until, until it doesn't. And then, you know, that, that lack of partnership and relationship with investors, suppliers, vendors, retailers comes back to haunt that company because mm -hmm. it didn't act in the spirit of partnership. So it comes back to being a great human being, thinking about a successful entrepreneurial journey as a series of great partnerships and relationships and always looking at the eye of creating win-win situations for everybody throughout that journey, as opposed to a scorched earth, zero sum game. No, those are wonderful observations. I, I love the fourth one, especially, and, and the first one as well, which is very important. Uh, we have let me just wrap up with one final question and then you know, we can take the, the questions from the audience. Uh, I hope we are in the new normal and there aren't any more waves. So I uh, would like to understand you know, if you've seen any perceptible lasting changes in consumer behavior when compared to pre-pandemic uh, days. I think we're still, I think we're still evolving. Um, mm -hmm. So it's interesting, you know, I think, I think there was a perception during the core lockdown periods of the pandemic that, you know, consumers, you know, I think there was some extreme, extreme cases where people would believe, oh, well, like we've, e-com everything is going to be the future. And mm -hmm. I think it's continued to prove as the, as the, at least the U.S. has opened up, is that it's truly an omni-channel environment. There was definitely certainly acceleration in e-commerce engagement during during the core parts of the pandemic, but consumers mm -hmm. consumers want to buy they want to buy their products everywhere they are, and sometimes that's through their phones in e-com, and sometimes they still want to walk into a store. But having said that, all stores aren't created equal, so stores need to create a great a great consumer experience, and so you know, we believe in an omni-channel world. And I think it's continued to prove it's an omni-channel world, um, but it's very competitive. So consumers, investors, entrepreneurs, 
need to continue to deliver the best experience they can to 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 brand to consumers both online and offline and you know i think in some ways so, in, in some ways things didn't change you know it just yeah. made it more it just things just got more competitive all right great so let's uh, jump to the q and a uh, i'm i'm taking the first one first so this is from uh, vikram uh, the question is how do you define fully loaded gross margin when when you said that 30% fully i would just loaded. look at i would just look at us gap you can look at it online you know it's gross sales minus various trade spend promotional spend that people use and returns in um you know in the brick and mortar and online channels you have net sales and you minus uh subtract out the product costs um mm -hmm. freight you know freight in um some people put freight out and warehousing in there sometimes you don't depending whether you're vertically integrated or not and then mm -hmm. you have uh you have you have gross margin i think given how expensive freight is it's very important for i i i'm very keen on check looking into what what's what's the margin after all freight and warehousing because a lot of that that can be a very meaningful part of the PL, you know, mm -hmm. in today's day and age. So someone just quoting their product margin to me is not all that relevant. I want to know what the margin is after all freight and warehousing. Got it. And trade Got spend. Great. Um I think the next one question is not very clear. So I'm skipping that. Uh, Ankita is uh, question is on what are the key principles of inorganic growth? How do you value businesses you want to acquire? And what risk exposure should be taken into consideration? I think her question is more on principles to use when when a founder is thinking about you know inorganic roll up uh, in terms of valuation, et cetera. I'm not sure I understand the question. Yeah. As I read it, even I'm not uh, too sure. So let, let me jump to the next one. No problem. And I'm not saying it's a bad question. I'm just saying no, I, 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 know. I just don't I cannot, understand it. Uh, I'm, I'm not very sure either. So in the interest of time, I'm just going to the next question, uh, which is what are some case studies in the US that Series A brands can look at to learn how to go omni-channel? Um, I mean, you know, I think Quest was one, you know, I'm, I'm, I was trying to name somebody, a brand that's not ours, because I, 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 I'm, I'm another no, pet peeve. Are, fine. You have a my lot my of pet peeve also is our investors that just promote their own brands all the time. And I, I, it's a pet peeve of mine that I don't like. Yeah. Um, so, but just in, I'm, 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 I need to answer quickly. So, yeah. you know, Quest was a brand that started online. They built, they were actually the first. They were one of the first brands to have a Facebook influencer strategy. There wasn't even a name for it yet then. It just happened to be consumers who organically posted before and after pictures of utilizing Quest and as a primary portion of what they ate. And mm -hmm. they leveraged that consumer passion into um, you know, launching in specialty. So like GNC and vitamin shop in the US. Mm -hmm. And then that success parlayed into a massive launch with Walmart. Mm -hmm. um, you know, where we didn't, I think another point of advice here, where we made, mis where mistakes were made, there's that pricing wasn't done right. You have to build a pricing model out in advance of looking at what your pricing is direct to consumer, through distributors, through various different specialty mass and grocery channels. Everybody mm -hmm. has an expectation of where, what their pricing should be in that channel relative to other channels. And mm -hmm. if you don't get that pricing right from the get go, that can be a massive omni channel issue. So really think through as you start a company early, build out that whole pricing model on wholesale and what the shelf price will be and mm -hmm. what you discount it at or don't discount it at across various channels to make sure all of your economics work. Do that mm -hmm. upfront because it's really hard to fix later if you haven't done it correctly. Got it. I have a quick request. Do you mind if we go on for another five minutes? I just see a few more questions. Is that all right with you? Yes, another five would work. 
Thank you so much for that. Uh, the next question is from Siddhant. It says, brick and mortar stores take time uh, to establish and generate ROI. Are investors willing to be patient at the cost of growth? Is Capex to build brick and mortar stores okay for consumer brands? So I think his question is on whether investors are patient for brands to build out stores and generate ROI and whether you know, as a fund you're okay with brands funding the Capex for these stores. So, you know, the, a lot of the brands we focus on, they sell through third-party brick and mortar. So, you know, you know, in beauty, there are certainly cases where you're building out your own, your own brick and mortar stores. Mm -hmm. And, you know, but that's, you know, that's, that's fewer and far between, mm -hmm. you know, most of the categories we play in, the branded CPG brands are selling through a third party, you know, it, whether it's a specialty channel, you know, whether that's a Sephora in beauty or a Whole Foods market in food, and then they're going through other. So, but as it relates to four wall economics, you know, I think the four wall economics need to work relatively quickly. If you're building out a store to sell your own products, like it's just like, online the you know you can't build, bank on a long ltv chain it's the same concept you know it needs to it needs to economically work relatively quickly or there's there's real there should be real question of like why did you build that store and not right. go through a third party retailer or stay online digital got it uh, i think the next question we covered it's on uh, you know what are brands doing differently beyond Facebook ads and how can one differentiate or is just spending on marketing the only way forward? I think we touched upon it uh, you know at the end of our okay. conversation. Uh, the next one is on this is interesting your favorite B2C brand who you feel did everything right? <laughs> my favorite my favorite D2C brand. Um, gosh, um, I don't, I don't, I don't know. Um, or maybe you could, you could say more than one. <laughs> you know, because I, you know, I, I, Gosh, I got, I got to name one of my own again. I don't, you know, um, I think Daily Harvest is a really interesting brand and business where if you asked me 10 years ago, if someone could build a multi hundred million dollar direct to consumer brand with a frozen, a frozen supply chain, I would have never thought it would be possible. So to see what Rachel, the founder there has built in a frozen, a healthy plant-based frozen foods platform, all direct to consumer ha has been truly remarkable. And it, the, you know, it comes with the fact that they have tremendously market leading retention. So we talked about that earlier about how important retention is. Yeah. They, they really surprise and delight consumers where once they try daily harvest and they stay and that mm -hmm. you're able to build a, a business the, of that scale with a frozen supply chain is truly remarkable. So I really admire what Daily Harvest has built as a result. Got it. Okay. I, but again, I, I named my I named our own brand again, which is my own pet peeve, and it's <laughs> yeah. I, I I apologize for that. No problem at all. I I know how difficult it is to avoid that. We have more questions, but I'm just going to ask one final question and we wrap up. It's from Great. Amin, which is, what are the three most important things a startup must do to ensure good customer experience? Responsiveness. You know, um, it's amazing how many brands fail because they don't, they don't solicit and take consumer feedback well. So create a system where you're soliciting, you know, whether there's a, some type of incentive for a survey, 
make it very easy for consumers to share their feedback with you mm -hmm. and then take action, take care, spend the dollars to solve that problem for them and then fix that problem for everybody else so it doesn't happen again. Um, so that's one, make purchasing very easy. You know, um, having to, to go from one landing page to another landing page to another, whether to fill in a bunch of fields, you know, nobody wants to do that. So make, make purchasing easy, make, make consumer feedback easy, solve their problems quickly, you know, and I think you're going to, it's going to lead to great, great results. If your product is truly great. Got it. No, very, very uh, insightful. And, uh, you know, I know we've overshot and, uh, you know, to the audience, we have more questions, but since your apologies, we've run out of time. Uh, but Wayne, thank you again for joining us. This was a wonderful session and there are a lot of takeaways for, for us and for the founders, I'm sure. And, uh, you know, really appreciate you taking out the time and thank you everyone for, for joining. I know it's really late in Southeast Asia. Really appreciate everyone joining this. Thanks for having me. I really appreciate thank it. Thank you. Have a good well, night, everybody. I'm going to go start you. my day now. <laughs> Have a good day, Bye. And see you all in the next episode of Brick by Brick. Thanks. Thanks, everyone. Take care.